Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, while you are all entering into the chat here, a quick word of welcome to Unabridged Bookstore in this virtual space. Um, it looks like there are still a few people that are attempting to get into our room here. So let's give just a few more minutes before we hear from our guests tonight. Um, we're very excited at Unabridged to celebrate the release of To Raise a Boy and thrilled tonight to have the author with us. Um, if you're not familiar, the book just came out yesterday. Already some great reviews out there. So snatch up a copy when you can. I'll be dropping a, a link in the chat here in a second where you can buy the book from us. Um, and in just a second, we are gonna get to hear from Emma Brown. Um, let's see. Uh, while we're doing this, if you guys have questions um, throughout, if you wanna just type those into the Zoom chat, um, and then as time allows, we'll get through as many of those as possible. Um, also, if you have any questions about Unabridged or any of the other events that we have um, scheduled, feel free to respond to the email invite that you got or to pop those in the chat as well. Um, it looks like everybody is now in, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, tonight, we are thrilled to have Emma Brown. Emma Brown is an investigative reporter at the Washington Post and previously worked as a wilderness ranger in Wyoming and a middle school math teacher in Alaska before her life in, journal in journalism. Um, Emma now lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband and two children. And tonight, Emma is joined for this conversation by Andy McDaniel, the chief creative officer for CityCast, um, a national network of local news podcasts that I think just launched here in Chicago, right? Just about to launch in Chicago on the 17th. Okay, and before that, you were chief content officer at WAMU, the NPR station in Washington, D.C., right? Cool. Well, we are thrilled to have both of you here. Um, thank you for joining us tonight, and tell us about To Raise a Boy. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us. I can just, like, smell the coffee and... Uh, and, and feel the books nearby of actually being in, in a physical space. I miss it so much. Um, I'm so excited to talk about this book and to introduce you to Emma Brown. Um, I am, in addition to my job with CityCast, um, I'm also the mom of an eight month old boy. And so this is a book that I read with fascination, with horror, with curiosity, obviously with deep interest. And one thing it made me think about when I told people that I was having a boy, everyone always has advice when you're pregnant, of course. And one of the things I heard a lot of was, oh, it's going to be so much easier than having a girl. And what I took from that is, oh, you don't have to deal with the relationship stuff. You don't have to deal with uh, navigating so many complicated questions around what girls face. Emma's book has made me rethink that in many ways. Um, and made me question, have we underestimated the complexity of how boys become men, how they learn about sex, relationships, friendships, masculinity, power. Um, and as you'll hear from Emma, those questions affect not just the women that our boys interact with, it affects the well-being of our boys. So I'm, I'm really eager to get into that conversation. Emma and I know each other, we were classmates at the UC Berkeley School of Journalism. And uh, she was, I'll just say it, without a doubt, the most talented writer out of our, our whole class. So I'm very excited that she's poured that into something in, in, that, is, that is bound in a book now. Um, and, and let me just say, if you are a parent, an educator, a sister, a brother to a boy, this is such a critical piece of writing to read. Um, so with that, Emma, we're going to kick off the conversation by having you read a little bit from the book to give us a little bit of a taste. And I just wanna say congratulations. I know this book was a tremendous amount of, amount of travel, investigation, effort, blood, sweat, and tears, childcare, et cetera. So congrats. I know this is your first event on this tour. Well, dang, thanks, Andy. That is a really awesome introduction and thank you everybody for being here i appreciate it um yeah i'm gonna i'll, I'll read just real briefly uh and in the book the, the beginning of the book i explained that um when my son was six weeks old uh the first harvey weinstein stories broke and i was literally nursing him while scrolling through those stories and the many stories that followed um thinking about what does this mean for me as the mom of a boy how am i going to raise my son to be different and so uh, I'll pick up from there and read this brief, brief section. 
I'm embarrassed to admit that I had never given much thought to how boys learn to be boys until that moment in late 2017, sitting at home with my chubby cooing infant son, reading about the wrongdoings of men. Those men had been infants once too, and then they had grown up. For me, raising a boy feels a little like traveling in a foreign land. It was different with my daughter. When I gave birth to her three years before my son was born, I had no idea how to be a mother, but after decades of navigating life as a woman, I knew unequivocally what I wanted for her. My husband and I named her Juniper after the hardy trees that cling to the sides of mountains. I wanted to see her, I wanted her to see herself as capable of anything constrained by none of the old limits on who women must be and how they must move through the world. She could play with trucks and dolls. She could wear dresses and overalls. She could be an astronaut or a nurse. She could be fierce and funny and loving and steely spined. I am strong and fearless, I taught her to say when she was two as she hesitated on the playground, her lips quivering as she considered crossing a rope netting bridge strung 10 feet above the ground. I took her hand and helped her across, nudging her along with that mantra, which she repeated as we inched forward. There was nothing premeditated about that little sentence. It just appeared there on my tongue, distilling what I wanted her to be and how I hoped she'd think of herself. I had no such pithy motto for my son, August. Reminding a boy to be strong and fearless seemed unnecessary, unnecessary, maybe even counterproductive, fortifying a stereotype instead of unraveling it. What could I give him to help him ignore the tired old expectations of boys? to understand the limitlessness of his life's possibilities in the same way that I had wanted Juniper to see the limitlessness of hers. I had no idea. I didn't know how to help him resist the stresses and stereotypes of boyhood because I had never grappled with the fact that boys face stresses and stereotypes at all. There you have it. <laughs> it's really easy in our culture not to grapple with it at all. And I love how this book forces that grappling in a way with so many aspects of boyhood that I hadn't even thought about. So uh, I have, as you can imagine, quite a few questions for you. But first, as though we were, were in a real bookstore right now, uh, I know we have some special guests in attendance. So Emma, I wanted you to get a chance to acknowledge them. Yeah, um, I see a few familiar names. I'm glad for everybody who's here, but I really want to... Um recognize two special people, and that is Jamon Lynch and Paul Robinson, who are, <laughs> there's Paul waving, I see you. Um, and I don't know if, I, I don't see Jamon, I hope he's here too. Uh, Jamon and Paul told their story in this book, um, and I am super grateful to them for their generosity in sharing their experiences, and to Jamon in particular, for sharing his experience growing up in Chicago, um, and, and really sort of uh, weathering so many challenges that I can hardly imagine. So um, I learned a lot from these two and I'm so glad they're here. Journalists would be nothing without the people who agree to share their stories with us. So thank you. Wonderful, welcome. So I wanna start with the moment that sparked this book with which if you're just reading the title of the book, you wouldn't necessarily know about. So Brett Kavanaugh was about to be confirmed and suddenly we were hearing Christine Blasey Ford's name over and over again. It was becoming ubiquitous. No one knew it at the time, but you were right in the middle of that story. Tell us what was happening. Yeah, so this is um, this this was fall 2018. So it's about a year after this passage I just read you, where um, my son's born, and I'm wondering how am I going to raise my son. I, I went back to work um, at the Washington Post on our investigative team. Um, and had been passed a tip in the summer from somebody who had a story to tell um, about Brett Kavanaugh and that somebody was Christine Blasey Ford. And when she, she, she went back and forth about whether to tell her story publicly um, uh, because she felt there would be a, a huge price to pay personally and she wasn't sure it would make a difference. When she, finally, when, she, when she did decide to tell her story after it started leaking, she told it in the Washington Post um, in a story that I wrote and what, you know, in the aftermath of that story, um, I received a flood of emails from people who, who felt like they recognized something that had happened to them in, in the story that she had told um, about her experience in high school. So these were people who, who had been 
you know, they had had experiences long ago, many of them that they had never talked about, never told anybody about that had been really painful things that had happened to them as children. Um, and I, it, it intensified this question that I had sort of started with, with my son, like, oh, I, how does, how does this happen? What do we do about it? Um, and, and as you say, that was um, another impetus for, for writing this book. So I'm interested that you didn't go down the avenue of how we can raise our boys to be better so they can be better to girls, though maybe that's where you started in part. You went down the avenue of boys' experience sort of for its own sake. Could you talk about some of the questions about boyhood that this all sparked for you? Yeah, I think um, I I think I was so astonished to learn the kind of shame that boys feel. So shame is such a corrosive force, and uh, I think I had no idea until I started research for this book how much shame boys feel, and particularly when they do anything that might be seen as girly. And so when you talk about, you know, yeah, I think I did start this, this book thinking, well, this is gonna be about like, how do we, what do we do differently for boys so that there's less violence against women? And this book turned into something different, which is, I mean, there is some of that in here for sure, but also how do we do better for boys for boys sake? Um, because the, 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 way, the way that we're raising boys in America is leading to poor outcomes for men both in terms of health, um, mental health and physical health. And it's astonishing. I mean, men die by suicide almost four times as often as women in this country. Their lives are five years shorter. Um, they die of many diseases uh, more frequently than women. And, and, you know, we don't, I think we don't often talk uh, about this, um, about boys' issues and about men's issues in a way that centers them. And so um, I think that that is worth doing because, and maybe this is my bias as the mother of a son, but um, you know, I want him to have every chance in the world to, to um, be his full self and achieve his potential and all those things that parents want for their kids. And so when I read you know, those statistics, I of course have him in mind and other boys and think like, this is not, this is not okay, we've got to do better. One of the things that really stood out to me is what you wrote about in regard to friendships. And there's this sort of haunting image that you create of how boys have these rich and meaningful friendships throughout their youth, and then they just sort of vanish. What, why does that happen? <laughs> what, why, what, is, what is going on with that? What are the forces in our culture that are driving it? Yeah. I mean, this is, um, comes from the work of an of a, a NYU professor who has studied boys' friendships really um, by tracking boys, like cohorts of boys over years and interviewing them about their experiences. And what she has found is just what you said. So boys, just like girls, have an incredible need for um, and desire for intimate, emotionally intimate friendships. Um, and they have those friendships until she found, until like middle adolescence when they start to lose them um, and can't quite rebuild them or recover them. And that is right around the time when um, boys suicide rates skyrocket compared to girls. And you know, uh, correlation is not causation as we know, but, um, but you know, when I talk to older men about their experiences, I talked to one man who said he woke up he was 50 and he realized, he looked around, he realized he was alone. He didn't have friends. He didn't have people to share. I mean, he had friends. He had people to like go out with and do things with, but he didn't have people to like really share the deepest parts of his life with. And so I think, you know, um, why does that happen? I mean, one, one theory and, and I have met boys and young men who, who poo poo this. And I have met young boys and young men who say this is absolutely true for them that they've been told to that um you know to bury parts of themselves that make it really hard to then have close relationships with other people and by that i mean um you know if you grow up being told that you should not be girly well one thing in our culture that we ascribe to girls is emotional connection and emotional expression and if you can't articulate your emotions to yourself um or to other people it's really hard to connect and so um you know 
one boy, one young man I, I talked to had had such moments of crisis that he and didn't have people to connect with. He knew that that was a problem for him and he had, um, he had been working on that and felt like journaling had really helped him sort of get in a different space with understanding himself and connecting to other people. And even so, he told me, he wasn't, he felt kind of weird doing it like in a coffee shop in public because he felt like people wouldn't think that that was manly. Um, so he, he had been like grappling with these ideas and still felt kind of the press of cultural messages about what it means to be a boy, what it means to be a man that were getting in the way for him. You, there, there are a lot of different sort of tragic circumstances that you cover in the book. And and in a way, this loss of friendships and loss of relationships is a really significant one of them. But then you also cover some that are much more extreme as you talk about specifically sexual assault. And one that has really stuck with me is sexualized hazing. And part of what has stood out to me is that it feels like something I've heard about, but not tuned into until you put it in this particular context for me. So can you talk about what sexualized hazing is and how prevalent it is and the effect that it has on boys? Yeah, um, so this was one of the most, this was one of the most difficult and also sort of transformative part of the reporting for me was coming to understand that uh, sexual victimization of boys is much more common than we realize. Um, the one well-known survey that suggests it's as many as one in six boys by the time he reaches 18 has been sexually assaulted. And I think we think about boys being sexually assaulted. And I think a lot of times our minds go straight to Catholic church, boy scouts, like these scandals of older men preying on boys. And that certainly happens, but also, uh, boys, um, can be assaulted by their peers, both boys and girls, and by older women. And so, uh, you know, the sexualized hazing piece is really disturbing. This is um, boys, uh, older boys, putting younger boys in their place on sports teams, um, showing who's in power by attacking one another. Um, and, you know, I wrote, for example, about a 15 year old freshman who was attacked with a a pool cue by an older boys to the point where he had to be hospitalized. And, um, and, and yet we don't always think about these as sexual assaults or rapes. They have, they have the same lasting impact that the sexual assault or rape of a, of a girl would, would have. And so they're hidden, um, they're hidden problem because of the shame that boys feel in reporting. And I just, I, I think because of our own biases, as adults, like we don't think about boys as victims. It makes it hard for us to see them that way. I mean, one, one middle school boy um, who was sexually assaulted in, in his music class in front of the entire class um, and went to report this to his principal. Uh, the principal later said in an investigation, you know, had the same thing happen to a girl, he absolutely would have seen that as a sexual assault. Um, but because it was a boy, he saw it as horseplay. And why does that matter? Like, why does it matter what we call it? Well, it matters because of the support that you get or you don't get, right? After something like that happens to you. And this boy, um, uh, you know, he, he didn't get the support he, he needed for, for quite a while um, because he, or he, I mean, his parent, he didn't get the support at school in terms of um, helping protect him from the people who had hurt him and that kind of thing got support from his parents who, um, you know, were there for him every step of the way. But uh, yeah, I think the takeaway from, from this is like, we, we carry around assumptions about boys even when we don't realize it. And one of those is this idea that boys can't be victims, but they, they really absolutely can. It's, it's such a scary thing to think about, obviously as a parent, as anyone who cares about a little one. And I, I wanna read a statement that really stuck with me from, from the book, but just to put it in context first, another thing that I heard a lot as we were plan expecting a boy, um, when we talked about circumcision, the advice I heard a lot was that we should do it because we didn't wanna create a situation where our son would get teased in the locker room. I heard about the locker room again and again and again, the locker room. 
And so as you've described this sort of locker room behavior, it just really resonates with me. And I'll, I'll read, I'll read this statement. It's, it's really about what, what parents can do and sort of what, what binds us. So it says, often father's desire to support their boys runs up against a desire to protect them from cruelty in a world that doesn't show much tolerance for gender non-conforming boys. So you're talking in that statement specifically about gender non-conforming boys, but I think it really applies to all parents in so many ways. How do we protect our kids from cruelty, but at the same time set the bar that they absolutely can be anyone and anything they wanna be? Yeah, I think that is the central tension of it, that and I'm so glad you asked that. I talked to a father who's in the book who talked about growing up in Chicago, actually, in the 80s and in, in a in a community where he felt like he had to be tough all the time and he couldn't show any cracks uh, or they'd be take or he'd be taken advantage of. And now, you know, he's the father of an eight year old and his eight year old boy asked him. They were at the mall and asked him for a, an American girl doll. And the father was really wrestling, like he wanted to give his son what he wanted, um, what he was passionate about. He wanted to show his son dolls are fine for boys, right? And on the other hand, he, he didn't want to expose his son to cruelty, just as you said. And I think, um, I mean, I think we, one thing is we can give our kids safe havens at home to be themselves and to be unabashedly themselves. And also we need help. Like parents can't go to school and change everything that happens at school. We can't be there every moment in the locker room. And that that is really a hard thing to take, but we do need help from, I think the, the institutions that are helping us raise our sons, schools and teams and faith communities. And I think that, that there are more, I mean, one of the things that really gives me hope at the end of this book, I felt a lot of hope. Um, and that's because I think there are more and more efforts to do that, to create spaces outside of, outside of homes, um, in the places where boys live their lives uh, that are safe for boys to sort of think about and in collectively and challenge some of these ideas that get beamed at them about who they're supposed to be and how they're supposed to be. So you're starting to get into some of the solutions, which I think it's impossible to talk about all of this stuff without yearning for, okay, then what the heck do we do? But before we entirely get into that, I have to ask about sex ed and about porn because it's <laughs> one of the most eye-opening aspects of this book. What happened to sex ed? I mean, look, I, <laughs> I used to teach middle school and then I covered education for years, uh, first locally in DC and then nationally. And not until I wrote this book and really dug into this um, kind of obscure CDC beta did I see, did I understand how much sex ed has evaporated out of public schools. I didn't know that. Um, and not just like, not, not just the controversial stuff that you might, you know, first, first come to mind, but like puberty education is also, you know, I include that as part of the evaporation. And so, and then there's other data showing that a lot of parents aren't talking to their kids about sex, sexuality, consent. So that leaves a vacuum. And that vacuum is often, you know, filled by online pornography, which has become really easy to access anywhere, um, thanks to phones and, and other technology. And so the problem with that is that so much of what's in pornography online is not respectful or consensual. And so if you're leaving, you know, if we're leaving boys to learn um, from pornography, man, we're putting them in danger, I think, and, and the, their partners in danger because we're creating, we're allowing them to create really um, unrealistic notions about how sex works. Um, for example, I talked to a young woman in, two young women in Maine who told me about being choked in the middle of sex without any, any warning by their boyfriends and they, because that is something that their boyfriends had seen um, in pornography and, and it seemed cool in pornography. So they did it. Um, it is not cool to choke somebody without asking, right? It's not really cool to do, to touch anybody in a way that you haven't made sure is okay with them. And so this, so, the, you know, this is a huge way we are not supporting 
boys, not supporting girls either, but since this book is about boys, <laughs> we need to do better. We need to start way younger, both. And I think that goes for both parents and schools. Um, we have to give them the guidance that they need to be able to navigate this really important part of their life. Um, you know, intimate relationships are a big part of having a, a good quality of life and we should give them more support. So having these conversations actively with our kids is, is one solution. I wonder if you could go on to, to, to sort of paint a picture for us of a healthy adolescence. It's so easy to imagine this really ugly period in which we sort of lose our children and all this bad stuff happens to them and they sort of become something else as they become men, with boys specifically. What's a better image of adolescence where we do have those conversations? What else is happening that makes it healthy? Yeah, I mean, one of the one uh, really helpful thing I heard from a, a woman who um, is a professor who sort of oversees this huge repository of studies on adolescence. Um, and she told me like one of the main takeaways is that parents matter and that even when you think your kids don't want to hear from you and aren't listening, they do and they are. Um, and I heard that from boys too, who said, I wish, I wish I could talk more with my parents about this stuff, you know, whether that stuff is um, intimate relationships or it's how do you balance, one boy said to me, how do you balance, he wanted to ask his father, how do you balance work and family? which was so interesting because that's a question that like women get asked about all the time. He was, he was struggling with that as a young man about to go off to college. He couldn't figure out sort of what to envision. So I think that the, when I think about how you do this, um, I met a father and son, eighth grader and his dad who had a beautiful relationship and it was warm and it was open. And this boy faced all the pressures that we were just talking about when he went to school. And he also knew who he was and he knew what his values were and he knew he had a safe place in his dad and in his mom to go ask questions and confide. Um, for, the, for this dad and his son, that space was the walk around the block every day um, to take their dog out. Uh, but they had, they, had a, you know, they had this sort of ritualized space where they could talk about hard stuff. Um, he said when his son was 10, he asked him out of nowhere, what is rape? I mean, whoa, like, but, but he had created a space where his son knew he was safe to ask anything that he needed to ask. And, um, and he knew he'd get a, you know, straight in answer as his father could give him. So I guess uh, uh, when I think about um, what that healthy adolescence, I hope will look like in my household, um, that's what I, that's what I hope for is a warm and open relationship where these struggles don't have to be hidden um, and sort of buried and dealt with, uh, you know, my son won't have to deal with them all by himself. So of course, part of the solution is at home, part of it is outside the home and you actually highlight a, a number of programs that are making progress outside of the home. Two of them are in Chicago. Could you talk a little bit about the programs that you found out about and, and why you know what they're working? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I felt really lucky to get to come to Chicago. Um, did my reporting for this book before the pandemic, which was, uh, <laughs> really but you're not in Chicago it. now. <laughs> um, so one of them, uh, and maybe folks in the, in the audience are familiar with them. Uh, one is called becoming a man. It's run by youth guidance nonprofit in Chicago. And this is a program for middle school and high school boys. Uh, where they meet in groups in school um, weekly with a counselor, and they 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 do act, they they do a couple things. They check in with each other. They have a check in where they they get really real really fast, and they talk to one and they they share what's actually going on with themselves. I mean, one boy who had been through it told me about the first time he went out of his high school, and all these guys who acted so tough in the in the hallways and were kind of intimidating were were sharing like they were really sharing in this circle. They sit in a circle and he knew he wanted to come back because um, he hadn't experienced that before. They also do activities and challenges um, that help them work through, you know, interpersonal dynamics and, and, and think, about, think about how they think 
Um, and so how do we, so this, this program has had pretty incredible results that I've never seen. As, as I mentioned, I covered education for a long time. You don't really see results like this very often. Um, boys who go through it, 50% less likely to be arrested for violent crimes and 19% more likely to graduate from high school. And on the strength of those results, becoming a man is spreading um, to other cities uh, in this country. Um, and I think, you know, they, the program has a lot to teach us about the space that boys need to, to be real with one another and also the, the mentorship that can be so powerful. Um, so there's a lot of different theories about why this program is successful, but if you talk to boys themselves, they say it's because of the counselors. It's because I have a safe place where I can um, share myself and I can um, get the support that I, that I need. So, and then briefly, um, Paul and Joanne, I met through Chicago Cred, um, which, which uh, you know, tries to get at the problem of gun violence in the city by um, by giving the support to young men who who have been involved in gun violence before um, the support that they need, whether that is help finding a job or therapy or housing assistance, like these underlying causes that make boy life uh, more difficult for boys and young men. Chicago Cred is is working to you know, help, help get at those root causes. So I've got a few more questions, but I want to encourage folks to drop their own questions in the chat and we will respond to them in, in the order they're posted. So feel, feel free to do that and we'll make our way to them. Emma, what are you do, doing differently with your kids since you wrote this book? Both of them. Uh, yeah, both of them. Well, so I started this um, by reading that passage about telling my daughter um, to be strong and fearless. And I've changed a little bit on that front. I'm, try I'm telling both of my kids now to be strong and gentle because I realized uh, I don't want to tell my daughter she has to be quote unquote masculine. Um, she can embrace the parts of her that we traditionally think of as, as girlish. And so can my son they can both sort of have access to those best of those two worlds. Um, and so that's one thing I do differently. I try to think about encouraging them both to, to access both parts of themselves. Um, I'm more uh, intentional about talking to them about their personal boundaries and making sure they understand that they, they have personal boundaries that they can defend and what to do if they feel like somebody's um, violating their personal boundaries. And I think I'm more intentional about calling out the stereotypes about boys that I see in the world. I was already doing that, of course, with my daughter. I was always calling out the stereotypes that, uh, that sort of get beamed at her about what it means to be a girl. And I'm much more intentional about doing that with both of them um, to show them that those messages exist about boys too and are important to see so they can, so we can challenge them. So we have a, a question from a, a, an unabridged customer from earlier today. The, the phrase toxic masculinity is of course used often now, particularly on social media. How helpful is that kind of online discussion? Does it contribute to helping young men or does it just shame them? That's a great question. And I, I wrote in the book um, that I lay off that term and I think we generally should in talking with excuse me, boys and young men. And the reason is that it's a really loaded word or a really loaded term that people hear in different ways. And I found that boys hear it as an attack on boys uh, or an attack on masculinity. One boy said to me, a high school student in St. Louis said, if you use that term, no one's gonna listen to another word you say. And I appreciated his candor uh, and I took to heart what he said. And I, I think if we um, want boys if we want to have productive conversations with boys, uh, it helps to use language that they can embrace and that they feel is, is fairer to them. So I instead talk about the pressures that boys face because I find that boys are really happy. They, they do feel pressures and they're happy to talk about them. Um, and I also borrow a term that's been used for a long time by feminist men, 
uh, the man box, which is that set of expectations um, that boys sometimes feel like they're being jammed into. Um, and, you know, those, I think both of those are, are, are more constructive ways to talk with boys and young men about the, the world we live in. So we have someone here talking about a, a fear that I know a lot of us parents of boys share. I worry that my teenage son will mess up while exploring intimacy as kids do and be marked, shamed forever as some sort of predator. How do we navigate this? I can relate to that, um, that fear. And I, I think, um, schools for a long time uh, have been really, really, really bad about addressing sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, and now, now I think that there's some, in some places, some fear that maybe schools are, are going too far in the other direction. I wrote about one boy who was kicked, you know, he was expelled from his um, school and, ma and made to go to an alternative school because he had he had said some really crude things to some girls, uh, which he admitted saying, and he had been accused of touching one of them inappropriately, which he denied. But he, you know, the impact on him of that suspension or that uh, expulsion was dramatic. And, um, and he, in his depositions, there was a court case about it. He, he described sort of being confused because he had seen other boys act in this way. And now he was, he was, being told he couldn't go to school because he had acted in this way. So I think there, you know, in the, in the book I write about restorative justice as done, done well, as a way to help boys take responsibility um, for what they've done in a way that doesn't then sort of make them outcasts or, or mark them forever, like gives them a way to take responsibility um, and be accountable and repair the harm that they've done and learn from it. And like, that's, you know, if we could do that well, um, we could help boys learn from the mistakes that they make and atone for the harm that they've caused. That's the goal, right? Um, and I think that that's possible, but I, I relate to that um, fear that Sierra expresses. And, and part of that, I think for parents feels out of control. Like that's gonna be something that happens uh, if it happens um, without us, without us being able to to help it, and that is a scary feeling. Another question here: How do we teach boys that the emotional connection that you mentioned is worth seeking, if cultural messages suggest the opposite? Well, I think that this is one of the really tough things for boys right now in this moment. That. On the one hand, you know, um, there are these middle schoolers in Minneapolis who are, they were, they had um, just watched the movie, The Mask You Live In, which is uh, just about, about some of these themes. And they were, they were sort of like, everyone's telling us that we're supposed to be emotional, but like, we don't want to be like, <laughs> so they're caught in this, uh, they're caught in this world where they, um, they've been brought up in a culture that's sort of told them one thing. And now there's been a big shift in the last couple of years where they're getting a lot of new messages about masculinity and about rethinking masculinity. And I think that's really confusing. These mixed messages, like what, what, what do you want me to be? You know, I think that there's a lot of that feeling among boys. I mean, I think that, um, uh, boy, I don't know that you need to teach boys that emotional connection is worth seeking because I think that they know that and they uh, feel that. Um, I write in the book about a, an experiment that was called the still face experiment where infants, uh, the infants are with their mothers in this experiment and the mother goes totally still face, doesn't react to the child at all. And because the child wants so much to to connect with his mother, he gets really distressed by that still face. And boys and girls have the exact same reaction. Boy, boy and girls, babe, boy and girl babies want very, it's like a primordial need to connect. And so I don't know that we really need to teach boys that it's worth connecting. I think we need to make space for that kind of emotional connection in our own homes so that they can remember how good it feels. And then they will, you know, they'll want that in their, in their lives.
boy, the idea of, <laughs> of maintaining a still face while while looking at a baby that just seems like torture as a mom to do that I don't even know if I can do it you can watch videos of this experiment online and it's torture to watch oh because the babies get <laughs> so upset when their mother won't react so, yeah. I can hardly tolerate him <laughs> squeaking just a little bit when somebody else is, is holding him um so you talked about changing definitions uh, around masculinity and how that's sort of changing under our feet a question from Sierra have you noticed any changing messages around masculinity as Gen Z is exploring gender more expansively? Well, we just had this whole potato head controversy. Um, I think, uh, you know, we see it in toys and I think that's really, I'm serious about the potato head controversy. Like there is a, a movement, uh, a small but noticeable movement away from this sort of like hyper gendered toy thing um, into more gender neutral or gender inclusive toys. And I think that's interesting because toy companies are really good capitalists and they know what people, what people will buy and are looking to buy. And so I think the fact that they're investing in toys that, that meet this um, new, this sort of new expansiveness that, that Sierra is talking about is a really powerful sign that, um, that, uh, there's a, there is an appetite for that among parents, um, of this, of this upcoming generation. Um, so yeah, I think that, I think the fact that we see it coming out in business tells us that, that that is a real thing. But what's interesting to me is that while that is happening on, you know, while there is sort of a, a new embrace of, of the gender spectrum, there is also signs of a sort of retrenchment. And um, there's a survey of high school seniors that gets done, has been done for many, many, many years. And for many years, um, high school seniors were becoming sort of more into gender equity. They're more likely over time to say that men and women should share household decisions equally and so on. And in recent years, um, it's actually gone, it, it, it has not continued that way. And more, more high school seniors are saying that they believe, for example, that the man should make the decisions in the, in the family. And so what is that about? That's really confusing. I think it is in part about the polarization of our country on so many lines and gender is one of those lines. So that even as we see, um, you know, uh, new swaths of our country and Gen Z is a good example, thinking differently about gender, then we see also this, you know, at the same time, others who are thinking more traditionally. So just in case uh, some of our, <laughs> our attendees are Googling it right now, is, what does this mean for the potato head family? <laughs> <Are> the potato <laughs> head? <laughs> you know, this was very confusing, but I think Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head are going to continue being Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head, but there's also just going to be Potato Head, which doesn't have to be Mr. and Mrs. Um, okay. You can just make whatever kind of potato you want. You know, there was a whole backlash in the last few days um, among people who felt like because of this, this was, this was um, the same thing happened when Target got rid of their uh, naming their boy and girl toy aisles. Um, and I wrote about that in the book too. Like people felt like that is somehow unnatural to take away the boy and girl aisles or take away the Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head. A lot of strong feelings, but it's because we have a lot of strong feelings about gender in America. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of strong feelings, a question from me, there's, you had to get so many people to open up for this book. And I wonder how you pulled it off. Uh, this obviously was incredibly sensitive topic matter. In some cases you were speaking with young subjects. How did, how did you get them to open up? And also how did you handle just the dynamics of talking to some boys who were under 18 about something this sensitive, sort of paint a picture of what that was like? Yeah, well, as, I, as I said at the top, I am really grateful to the people and particularly the boys and young men who spoke to me for this book and shared their experiences. Um, and I think as a, as a reporter, uh, the best, you know, I, the best thing I have, the best tool I have is my ability to listen. Um, I'm a good listener and I think I, I care a lot about people 
And so when they tell me their stories and I'm listening carefully, I mean, if you think about it, like how many times in your life, how many times in your day do you get listened to really intently? How many times does somebody care a lot about your experience in the course of a day? And, you know, I think for a lot of people, that's a pretty new feeling um, or one that they haven't had all that often. And so, um, you know, I think that that is why people talk to talk to me or talk to any reporter. Um, and talking to boys who are, who are under 18 um, is, you know, we have a special responsibility, of course, to take care of when you're talking to children. I have a lot of experience from it, just from reporting on um, schools and education for a long time. And I'm, I'm comfortable around kids. I like kids um, and I like to know how they see the world. Well, I think the fact that you were the reporter that Christine Blasey Ford chose to open up to is an indication that you are in fact a really great listener and uh, immediately establish your, your trustworthiness. Uh, I'm more comfortable a question. listening than talking, so. <laughs> <laughs> that could be, that could be. Well, it's a great quality uh, for your profession. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, a great question here that I really relate to and imagining and imagine happening in the future for me. Um, before my son hit adolescence, I thought I was really great about talking sex, intimacy, consent, et cetera. Then when stuff got real, I found myself frozen often and really uncertain about what to say and how to say it. Did you find great models and resources for talking to boys about sex and intimacy that you would recommend? Even for those of us who think we haven't figured out until it gets real. Yeah, that is a great question. And I think, um, I think there's a bunch actually out there to help. And I think that, um, uh, so I'll name, I'll, I'll name a few. There is, um, there's a book about just, it's just about talking to teenagers about sex and consent by Shafia uh, Zaloom that came out last year. And I don't have the title right in front of me, but um, it's in the, in my book, uh, <laughs> Sophia Zaloom is her name, Z-A-L-O-O-M. And I've heard her speak. Um, she is a, uh, she's a, a sex education teacher in San Francisco and teaches a whole course on, on dating and intimacy for high school students. And, um, and she, when I saw her speak was just, she like, she has a lot of really solid kind of concrete advice about how to have those conversations. Um, I think too, um, uh, there are other resources that you can go to, like if you're not comfortable having that conversation or you find yourself freezing. Um, the, I, I took a year of sex ed at my church, the Unitarian Church, that has actually a really well-regarded comprehensive sex ed uh, curriculum. And so there are, there are other resources out there in the community. Like I think parents, it's great if parents can have the conversation, you know, have an ongoing conversation, whether it's like picking up um, news stories or bits of pop culture to start conversations about uh, sex or about consent or what have you. But if you're not comfortable doing it, like there are other resources you can give your kids so that they get the benefit um, of having that guidance from somebody uh, if, if it feels kind of insurmountable to give, to give, give them what you think that they need. You know, this is cheating a little bit uh, to one of the later chapters of the book that gets to solutions and takeaways. But I wonder for those who um, who haven't yet read the book, but want to take away sort of what do I do about all this terrible stuff that I now have to worry about? What are three things parents should take away? Sort of what are, what are your what are your top takeaways Sort of things we have control over that we can do differently to help our boys? Some of them I've already mentioned, but they are important. So I'll say them again. So one is, I think we should tell our sons what we tell our daughters about the sacredness of their bodies and the sacredness of everybody's bodies um, and the, the right of each person to determine uh, how their body is touched. And uh, that's a really important message, I think, to start with when kids are young, both, both for their own protection and so that they know how to respect other people too growing up. Um, I think that, uh, as I said, you know, you asked me what I'm doing differently with my kids. I think um, seeing, seeing and calling out the kinds of messages that are being beamed at your kid, at your son, 
um, and explaining that those are stereotypes and that's not how everybody is, um, is really important too. Um, and then I think, um, you know, this idea of having a safe place where you can be yourself. I mean, that is certainly the, one of the greatest gifts my parents gave me. Um, and I think it's a, it's a gift that parents can give their kids to, not, to let them be themselves. And I, you know, um, a uh, couple things come to mind here. I, I talked to quite a few young men who told me about kind of the rules their fathers laid down for how they were supposed to be. I mean, one young man told me about how he loved to dance. When he was six years old, he just loved to dance. And his father told him, no way, like you are not to dance. That is not what boys do. And he also told him like, boys don't cry and things like that. But for some reason, like the joy that's in dance and thinking about this little boy being told like, that is not something that you're, is appropriate for you was, was so heartbreaking to me. Um, so I think, you know, if we think about what, like, what is it that we, we are carrying around um, and telling our boys they're supposed to do, supposed to be, and trying to, trying to um, think through those things and undo them if, if, if there's, if they're not productive so that our boys can be themselves. So I think we have time for one more question here. Um, did you find differences in attitudes towards and practices for raising boys across racial and, and or ethnic lines? So one of the most interesting things I came upon while doing this work was this um, really sort of sprawling massive study that's being led by researchers at Johns Hopkins University. They are studying gender um, and gender norms among 10 to 14 year olds uh, in five, on five continents, including here in the United, here in the United States and North America. And what was interest, what's interesting about what they found to me was they found what one researcher called a global script that boys, um, boys get told to be dominant, to be strong, to be tough, girls get told to be beautiful, to be submissive. And that not only is that a global script, but it is also true in many, in many places that there's a little more room now for girls to push up against those boundaries, press back against those boundaries. And things for boys are still very like tight and confined. Uh, these rules are still pretty strict for boys. Um, so that was interesting. That was interesting to me. I think there are absolutely differences across uh, all different, you know, across all different kind, all different lines in how we what's appro what, what we think of as appropriate for boys versus girls and so on. But the fact that there's this commonality um, and a commonality too in the you know to, to bring it back to the beginning where we're talking about a lot of hard stuff, commonality too in the suffering that boys experience. So they found that boys um, in that age group were more likely to have been physically neglected and physically abused and sexually abused by an adult, which was shocking to me. Um, the, the idea that, you know, boys were at a great advantage relative to girls, it didn't, it wasn't true in, in a lot of, you know, in a lot of these data points. And so, you know, that, that was, that underlined for me um, how important it is for us to, for us to do better for boys. Emma, what makes you hopeful about all of this, about the direction that we're heading? I am so glad my son is growing up right now as opposed to 20 years ago um, or 10 years ago even. I think there is a lot more, there are a lot more people and organizations thinking about boys and thinking about what boys need to thrive. But also like the most hopeful thing for me was the boys I met and the young men I met who are really sort of leading the way in educating their peers about, um, about sexuality and intimacy and consent, but also in rethinking kind of broadening what it means to be a boy. So one, I will close by I, this one uh, sixth grader who I kind of just wanted to hug when he said this, he, he, I met him at a school in California and he said, you know, that saying boys will be boys. Well, that means boys can be anyone they want, any, anything they want. They can be compassionate. They can be creative. They don't have to be held back by stereotypes. And <laughs> I loved that he existed in the world and was so proud to tell me that. 
That definitely makes me feel differently about that phrase, <laughs> boys will be boys. It makes me like it. Um, Emma, it is such an honor to host your very first book event for this upcoming tour. Wonderful that you don't have to leave your house to go on tour. Um, <laughs> I know this book will be wildly successful and we will be hearing more and more from you in the coming days and weeks. Um, to our audience, uh, thank you so much for sharing your evening with us. I urge you to, to buy the book. You can buy it from Unabridged Bookstore. Um, I think they're going to be sharing the link in the chat to make it really easy. Read it, talk about it with your families. If we all keep this conversation going, um, you know, boys, boys being boys can be better for boys and for everyone. So um, thank you. Thank you all so much. And I think with that, we'll close. Have a great night. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everybody.